Oil at the North Slope. Oil at Alaska's North Slope at Prudhoe Bay. A lot of it. Possibly the biggest discovery in history. Who knows? It's there, all right. But how does one harvest and deliver a product so plentiful without transportation over the endless miles of tundra? And the nearest city, Fairbanks, some 300 miles to the south. The answer was found. Pipe, a giant 48-inch pipeline. A project of seven of the large oil companies known as Alaska Pipeline Service Company. A pipeline from oil-rich Prudhoe Bay, 800 miles south of Valdez on Prince William Sound. The northernmost ice-free port in North America. Japanese ships carrying the pipe from the mills in Japan run a convoy conveyor line to the docks at Valdez, where the ships are offloaded and the pipe then trucked to a storage area. At Valdez, enough pipe is stored to reach north to Fairbanks. Seward on the Kenai Peninsula also has been a port where enough pipe has been delivered to span the remaining miles from Fairbanks to a location in Dietrich Pass in the Sawtooth Mountains of the Brooks Range, where it will meet the pipeline from Prudhoe Bay south. The Alaska Railroad transported the pipe delivered at Seward to Fairbanks, 400 miles north, where the pipe is stored till it will be needed. Although the construction of the pipeline will be started in several locations, each connecting with the other, basically it will be built in three sections, from Valdez to Fairbanks, from Fairbanks to a location in the Dietrich Pass in the Brooks Range, and from Prudhoe Bay south to meet the section from Fairbanks, a total distance of some 800 miles. The delivery of the pipe to Fairbanks and Valdez is a relative routine task. But the 167-mile section from Prudhoe Bay to meet the line from Fairbanks had to be delivered to the North Slope. In an area not serviced by ship, railroad, or highway, how does one transport 167 miles of pipe, each length averaging 58 feet long, a full 48 inches in diameter, and weighing over 8 tons? The challenge was posed and met by Yankee ingenuity. One of PAC's Indian head divisions, Alaska Barge and Transport Incorporated, and Puget Sound Tug and Barge Company's Red Stack Division, pooled equipment and talent, and the problem was solved. A sea lift by barges. A fleet of 14 specially constructed barges had to be built. The surface of their decks larger than a football field with 35-foot-high stanchions down each side to hold the pipe on the decks. Barges designed for one purpose, carry the pipe. But time was running short, less than a year to prepare. Since the pipe was being constructed in Japan, Pact conceived the idea, why not ship a portion of the pipe direct from the mills to Prudhoe Bay? To expedite this plan, Pack contracted with shipyards in Japan for the construction of two barges and Hong Kong for two more. The cosmopolitan atmosphere of Hong Kong was indeed a sharp contrast to the ultimate destination of the barges, the far reaches of the Alaskan Arctic. With almost unbelievable timing, these mammoth carriers came off the ways at Portland, San Francisco, Japan, and here at Hong Kong. Barges large enough to carry up to 16 and one half miles of pipe on each of their decks. At the port of Tacoma, Washington, the job of loading 10 of the barges began in February and would take till the middle of May to complete. 
It took a steady stream of freighters from the steel mills in Japan to the port of Tacoma to feed the hungry barges, each barge holding two to three shiploads of pipe. In the industrial city of Wakayama, Japan, where one of the three steel mills manufacturing the pipe is located, pipe is stored in holding yards. Trucks transport a never-ending flow of pipe lengths from the mills to the docks. At the Wakayama docks, the two barges built in Japan and the two built in Hong Kong are loaded simultaneously with the barges in Tacoma. dispatched two ocean-going tugs, Apache and Seminole, to tow the four barges to their destination at Prudhoe Bay. The Japanese were pessimistic. They said it couldn't be done. Impossible for two tugs, each towing two barges in tandem, across the Pacific to Prudhoe Bay and the Arctic Ocean. But Pack knew better. They knew their capabilities. There they go. Two tugs towing 5,000 lengths of pipe, spanning 54 miles in length and weighing over 40,000 tons. It could be done. It was done. In the meantime, the barges were loaded and lashed down in Tacoma, awaiting the departure date. At last, D-Day arrives, and the tows prepare for the long journey ahead. Powerful tugs are on their way, towing over 100 miles of pipe from Tacoma to their destination, Prudhoe Bay, some 3,300 miles to the north, well within the Arctic Circle, almost to the very top of the world. The pipe for Prudhoe Bay followed two routes from Japan, one by ship to Tacoma, Washington, 
the other via a new trade route pioneered by PAC direct from Wakayama. Both routes converged at a preconceived rendezvous spot in the Bering Sea, near Nome, Alaska. The big sea lift of 40 barges and 20 tugs is right on schedule. Included in the huge sea lift, aside from the 120,000 tons of pipe, are barges loaded with 67,000 tons of general cargo. After rendezvous, the fleet continues on its way toward the Arctic Ocean and Prudhoe Bay. At Point Barrow, 150 miles from Prudhoe Bay, the fleet begins to encounter the Arctic ice flow. This is not unusual. The fleet puts to anchor to await the opening of the flow. The plan was to arrive early and be in position to move on as soon as the unpredictable ice flow opens, which is usually no later than August 2nd. A company plane flies continual reconnaissance, watching for any trend of ice movement or channels where the fleet can move through. But there are none. Time is running out. Only a possible 40 days to get to Prudhoe Bay, unload the cargo, and return to Point Barrow before the long winter freeze of the Arctic Ocean sets in. August 6th, and still no channel opening through the ice but the effort must be made through the broken ice flow. An additional burden was put on the fleet because of the hazardous ice conditions. The second of the two barges each tug towed this far must be left at anchor south of Point Barrow and only one barge towed through the ice, delivered at Prudhoe Bay, then return for the second barge and repeat the journey. Experience and skill of the tug pilots are paramount under these conditions. For years, these pilots have been navigating the Arctic ice flow, serving the dew line along the top of the world. Without their experience, this operation would be impossible. The powerful twin diesel engines in these rugged tugs are tuned to perfection. No malfunction can occur now. Times, fog conditions become so bad the pilots are forced to navigate by radar only. The speed through the 90 mile ice flow is cut to one knot. The encounter of ice cakes at higher speed could tear open the hulls of the tugs and the barges. Easy does it. The only favorable condition to these skillful pilots is the 24 hours of daylight. The glare of the never-setting midnight sun on the ice flow is easily tolerated. Finally, after many hectic hours, the ice flow is conquered. In the open waters of the Arctic Ocean, it's full speed ahead and on to Prudhoe Bay. Toes begin to arrive in Prudhoe Bay, and now another challenge must be met and conquered. Because of the shallowness of the Arctic Ocean, only three to four feet at the beach, with a one-foot tide at most, the fleet is forced to anchor nine miles from shore in only 17 feet of water and transfer the cargo in small lots to shallow draft barges known as lighters for transportation to the beach. First through the ice flow, two work barges are already anchored in position to handle the lightering operation. Each barge is equipped with 200-ton cranes, 
living quarters for 50 men, galleys, communication centers, and one with a heliport. Because of the shallowness of the water at the beach, an 1,100-foot gravel causeway was built out into the Arctic Ocean to water deep enough to handle the cargo barges from the fleet for offloading. An instant dock was built by sinking eight barges, each 50 feet by 200 feet, at the end of the causeway, making an offloading dock surface 100 feet by 800 feet. Immediately upon arrival at the work barge area, the transferring of pipe from the huge line haul barges to the lighter barges begins. From mill to pipeline, each length of pipe will be lifted 10 times. Although the perfectly beveled ends of each length is protected by a protective rim, careful handling is still a prerequisite. When the pipe is stacked, whether it be on the big transportation barges, the lighter barges for the short nine-mile haul to the beach, or on the storage pads, it must be stacked so seam welds do not touch metal. It must also be handled so no damage can occur on the surface of the pipe. The pipe must remain in perfect condition from mill to pipeline. Each lighter barge is loaded till it draws only three and one half feet of water. Then by shallow draft pusher tugs, it is transported to the dock. The lighter barges and tugs have been transported from Seattle along with the cargo and will be transported back when the job is finished. Efficiency is of the essence. Trucks line the causeway to the dock, ready to receive the pipe from the lighters. As the first lighter arrives at the dock, things begin to happen. A steady stream of heavy-duty trucks transport the pipe over the beach to the staging area three miles inland. The smooth operation never ceases. The work continues around the clock. At a previously prepared 55-acre, five-feet-deep gravel staging pad, the inventory of the 167 miles of pipe begins to grow. The delicate ends have been well protected and the seam wells are positioned so they don't touch metal. The pipe, having been exposed to a variety of atmospheric conditions, has accumulated a rust surface. Not a pitting rust, but a scale rust, which acts as a surface protector. The pipe will be shot blasted to remove the rust, then treated with a protective coating before installed in the pipeline.
minute by minute, around the clock, the stockpile continues to grow. The proposed 800-mile pipeline route from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez will encounter every type of condition and terrain Alaska has to offer. Tundra, rivers and valleys, mountains, the biggest undertaking private industry has attempted, and the first 48-inch pipeline ever built in America. The immensity of the project staggers the imagination and almost eludes description. The northernmost section of the pipeline is delivered. 15,000 lengths of pipe each 58 feet long and 48 inches in diameter, 167 miles of it. A delivery job some said couldn't be done, but there it is. The entire operation, complete in every detail, is a tribute to minute planning, logistics, and execution by experienced people. An unbelievable job, well done.